Welcome to this episode of Observations for Our Time. We have Kirk and Scott here with us. And before we recommence in the 91st Psalm, the American political landscape has become so entertaining. How about that for a euphemism? Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ridiculous. But I thought we might discuss it a bit. I, I want to share with you kind of my overall take on it, then let's uh, get to uh, a, a few of the uh, issues. Uh, I think that the, on the Democratic side, I am flabbergasted, literally flabbergasted, that a communist, and make no mistake, Bernie Sanders is a communist, mm -hmm. uh, his entire mindset is to is to foist communism on an unsuspecting, unwary America by cloaking it in this nebulous concept of democratic socialism. Now, keep in mind, the Soviet Union was a socialist republic. The Nazi party was a socialist party. Uh, and to uh, unite with liberals so as to become entrenched and then to create his socialist slash communist state. And the fact that we have dumbed down a generation of young people through our educational system, our indoctrination system, that they would support this man, not recognizing that no communist society has ever succeeded, and that redistribution of wealth does not create wealth. In fact, it creates universal poverty. Except for a select few. How in the world could we have a country where this man is actually winning State after state, the last two states that were that were uh, uh, in the Democratic uh, primary process, he won by a landslide. God, this is not an America that I want to live in. <laughs> well, well, you can buy anything if you you know you can. Well, let me put it this way: you can sell anything if you give it away. And yeah, but, is, but, but but you know, if you want to, if, if if Bernie Sanders had actually worked at a job. He'd actually done something in his life productive, which he's never done. And if he had, by uh, through the the, the uh, his abilities, created tremendous wealth, and he wanted to give that wealth away, that's his business. Yeah. But he doesn't want to give his wealth away because he doesn't have any. What he wants to do is he's creating class warfare to yeah. to take. What productive people have made. And instead of trying to make more people productive, he simply wants to rob those who have been productive to bribe the votes of those who are dependent. Well, and he's doing it on the backs of people that are the same as him. They've never had anything. They've never had to pay a tax in their life. They've never had to no, do it, anything. But it's uh, amazing that we can have a society that is so prone to class warfare, so receptive to class warfare, and so ignorant of economics and how economics works. And, and it's not, you know, everybody obviously, if you have a job, you pay some sort of income tax, but that's not a tax. It's when you have to pay a property tax. I have to pay a property tax every year, mm -hmm. and, I, and it's just so I can live in a place that I already own. Yeah, you think you own it, but the government will take it from you if you don't pay them mm -hmm. a percentage of the value of that property every year. And, you know, in my case, I, I've got a, a, a second home in Ohio just so we can enjoy being part of our extended family and our granddaughter. And, our, uh, and in doing so, I'm paying 12000 no, excuse me, $24,000, just $12,000 twice a year, $24,000 in uh, school support. Mm -hmm. I don't have anybody in school. What, you don't? No. <laughs> in fact, even when I had children of school age... I sent them to private school because I tried the public school, and they were hellaciously bad. And they didn't give you a tax credit for that either? No. No, it's just it's just thievery. It's, it's absolutely repulsive. You know, when I actually asked one time for the help of the police during a period of time where I was just getting inundated with the death threats, and they were all specific. You know, we know where you live. We're coming after you. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill your family. Now, yes, I had uh, yeah, was support, but I figured the prudent thing to do was at least to notify the authorities that I was getting these and pass them on to them. And, you know what? Serious? If you had to come, you know what? You know what I got from them? That's your problem. Really? No, absolutely. We're not going to do a thing. What am I paying my taxes for? But there's, well, here's, sure, big, protect, right? well, here's yeah. the big problem. You're talking about why why Bernie's so popular. Look who he's running against. 
Oh, well, that, that's, that's, that's the next point I was going to. Yeah, the, uh, the Hillary Rotten Clinton, who was instrumental in lying about Benghazi. And I, I'm an issue, I have an issue with Benghazi because, not because of, uh, of anything other than she absolutely unequivocally knew that it was Ansar Sharia that perpetrated the attack and that it had absolutely nothing to do with the trailer for the Christian movie. And yet she, she edited deliberately a dozen CIA and State Department transcripts from the scene that said it was being perpetrated by the terrorist group, Friends of Sharia, Answer Sharia, and instead blamed it on the movie because what she wanted to do was to create the myth that extremists were the problem, not Muslims. And to do that, while the nation is engaged in countless wars in Islamic countries, I think is absolute treason. I, I created something for another show, but I, I want to share it here with you. Uh, I think you guys will like this. Um, this is from a speech that Hillary made uh, earlier this week on, on a show. Um, she said a certain word so many times. Here, here's the clip. Hold on. Transparency. I think the answer is transparency. That there will be uh, complete transparency. An answer for that is what we have been doing for the last several years, and that is uh, to be transparent about it. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Yeah, when you tell a politician like Hillary Clinton uses a word, what she means is the antithesis. It's, I'm not going to be transparent. No, it's the same as somebody tells you, trust me. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I'm making this point perfectly clear. That means it's murky as uh, is filth. Well, just trust me. <sighs> just trust me, right? I must be doing best for you, right? <laughs> Wow. Let, me, let me suggest something, going back to Bernie for one quick second, let me yes. suggest something that uh, most people don't realize. Uh, it, it, when they talk about soaking the rich, you know, to pay for the poor and all that, mm -hmm. the poor are a small group, the really, really, really rich are a very tiny group. Most of us that live in there that uh, suffer through try to get a business, I failed in business three times before I finally was able to put it together. I hired at my own expense, you know, and it, it was costly. Mm -hmm. As learning experience, I didn't want to learn that well, but uh, we finally made one that was successful, and, and and it didn't make us super rich, but it did very, very well. Mm -hmm. And we were paying at least 50% of every dollar that came in. You know, after you paid your overhead, then you get about 50% of everything we took home was gone. Oh, yeah. Then you you pay your, your, pay back, uh, your Social pay Security, security on behalf of your employees. Oh, yeah, 15%. Yeah, yeah you're, paying for their, you're paying for their health care. You're collecting tax on behalf of the uh, the government. You're forced into servitude in that regard. You're paying you fees and, have, and uh, property uh, taxes and business taxes and then income taxes. And it just goes on and on. Yeah. State taxes and federal taxes. And, you know, they're, they're all complaining that uh, countries are, are going overseas, that American companies are, uh, are leaving America and going to, to have headquarters in other countries. The reason we have the highest taxes in the industrialized world on corporations, that very people who create jobs, who build things and can employ people, we are taxing into oblivion so they can't compete anymore in America. You know, if you want more of something, tax it less. If you want less of something, tax it more. Uh, you know, now then you go on the Republican side. Oh, good grief. I mean, if there is a bigger lying scoundrel than Ted Cruz, I have yet to meet them. You know, personal stories, I think I shared this uh, vignette of, of how the gentleman that, uh, that has handled the, uh, the various, uh, um, speaking engagements that I've done on behalf of uh, Tea with Terrace and Prophet of Doom. Um, he uh, uh, is the largest in the world at what he does. He uh, was engaged by uh, Ted Cruz at a convention to uh, to get him on to some talk shows. Uh, there's a very standard rate for those shows. He was told what the rates were. Uh, he was booked on those shows. He uh, went on those shows. And then when uh, my friend presented him with the bill, he said we had an oral agreement and because it was only an oral agreement, I'm not going to honor it. You can stuff your bill. <laughs> He's got more in common with Bernie than I thought. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What, I mean, there's a reason that uh, before Trump became so popular, and we'll talk about him in a moment, 
um, most everyone in the Republican establishment came out and said anybody but Cruz. And from from the state governors to senators to to Washingtonians alike, in the Republican Party, the higher ups knew that Ted Cruz was a line scumbag, and they almost universally said anyone but Cruz. Now, now when their choice is Cruz or Trump, they'd rather have a line scumbag than they would somebody that they they can't control. Well, well Senator good. Graham said that you could kill Ted Cruz on the floor of the Senate and then hold the trial in the Senate, and you couldn't convict him. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't convict, right yeah. couldn't convict a murderer? Yeah. You couldn't convict a murderer. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, everyone who's had contact with Ted Cruz knows that he is a standard um, evangelical Christian, a man that you, that you couldn't trust as far as you could throw him. They're hypocrites, and he's the worst of a bad lot. An evangelical. <laughs> now... There was there was reason, despite some of his rhetoric, to show some enthusiasm for uh, Trump, uh, and that Trump was a way to show the Republican Party that they had become complete hypocrites, and that the that the party itself was um, disgusting, that the party itself had no scruples, and that it had lost touch with with what its members wanted. And with every vote and every time they try to circumvent the, the people's will, they're demonstrating that. So to one extent, that's positive. And to the extent that he is vehemently anti-politically correct, that's a positive. The fact that he says, we got a problem with Islam, that's a positive. But oh my goodness, some of the other stuff he says... <laughs> Well, for every one step forward, he takes like another one back. And it, oh, he oh. does. Oh. Yeah, the one, to, the one this week. I mean, two this week. One is mm -hmm. that if a law passages that uh, somehow uh, criminalizes abortion, that he would punish women who have abortions. I mean, you don't say that. I mean, that they listen. None of us are are pro-abortion. I think a woman ought to have. Pro-choice, and I am pro-life. You know, it, b b both positions are Im are embraceable, and there is nothing the president is going to do to change Roe v. Wade. There isn't. There is no scenario that you would get uh, justices appointed to the Supreme Court and confirmed that are going to, in in, a, in number sufficient to overturn Roe v. Wade. It isn't going to happen. And so, if you were asked a question about abortion, then you would simply say either it's a state's right issue and not a presidential issue, or, you know, it's a Supreme Court decision, not a presidential decision, so why should we talk about hypotheticals? Mm -hmm. You know, and you could say something like, I, I, I believe in liberty and women should have uh, be free to choose, and I am pro-life. And that, you know, abortion as a form of birth control is a horrible idea. Well, and that's always been my stance, too. Who am I to tell anybody what they can and can't do? Uh, you, can, you can make any choice you want to do. Uh, it doesn't up mean that to, I have to. Up to the point of murder. And so you have to define what is murder. Because we can't, we can't say it's okay for you to murder. And so it is a, it is a first uh, trimester infant uh, 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 when it's aborted, is or is that murder? Probably not, because that that infant is not viable outside the mother. For me, it always comes down to why are you getting why are you getting it? Yeah, third trimester, a different story. Third trimester, the uh, the the fetus is absolutely viable, and so you're killing a a a child that can live outside of the womb. Yeah, and for me, it's always been a, a very cut and dry thing. Why are you getting it? Well, yeah. I was raped. Okay, huh. then yes. Okay. Yeah, I got no problem with that. You, I got no you, problem with you, that. You get that. I got well, no problem with that. But I, wanted, I, 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 don't want it, I don't want it done in the third trimester, even under those circumstances. No, definitely not. But, oh, well, I'm getting an abortion because, um, well, I'm pregnant and I don't want the baby. Yeah. What? I can't be, I can't be bothered. But, you know, if you, if you were to make abortion illegal, first of all, there would still be 
Countless abortions. Well, drugs are illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, drugs are illegal, and they're and they're used by a huge percentage of the uh, of the country. Even the people that made them le- illegal. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, but the let's just say that you did diminish abortions. You know, the, the the majority of people that are having abortions aren't in a position to raise a child. Who? What are you going to do? To make them war to the states, you're gonna. Are you gonna create factories for raising children? You're gonna let our government try to raise children? What are you gonna do? Well, before we do that, let's define what our government does well. <laughs> Nothing. I'm, man, man, I'm still team. looking for it. Nothing. We don't even run our military well. No. We use it as a we use our military as a blunt as, instrument to make bad situations worse. We call our military peacekeeping. Oh yeah. <laughs> what? Wait, where, where, where do they where do they keep the peace? <laughs> Okay. Apparently, apparently we have these bombs that you can drop on places, and then it can like it blows up only thing it wants to blow up, and then it rebuilds everything around it. Right? That must be it, right? Yeah. You know the uh, the other thing that Trump said uh, just uh, I guess it was yesterday that the problem with our military is the Geneva Convention. Now the Geneva Convention just says, listen, war is probably a bad thing, but if you're going to engage in war, you can't torture your enemy. You can't subject your enemy to, you know, cruel and unusual treatment. You've got to feed them. You've got to shelter them if, you, uh, if they're captives. If somebody is giving, if surrendering, you, you can't go in and blow their brains out once they've uh, surrendered. Then you're responsible for, uh, for treating them as, as prisoners of war, and here are the rules. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it talks about uh, civilian casualties and trying to mitigate civilian casualties. <laughs> if... If you are opposed to the Geneva, Geneva Convention, you think your military will be more effective without it, there's something deeply troubled by, mm-hmm. by such a, a mindset. Why don't we just become Sparta? Oh, yeah, really. Why don't we just become Sparta at that point? Sure. Yeah, the world's longest-serving uh, democracy. No, no country on earth was a democracy longer than Sparta. And it was the most ruthless, savage country maybe to ever exist. And what they, they do with women had no rights whatsoever. Uh, boys were taken at youth and, uh, and beaten and tormented and abused uh, so as to make them uh, weapons of war. And all of their neighbors were enslaved because the Spartans were too busy either making warriors or fighting wars to produce food. Mm-hmm. All true. Yeah. So what, why don't we just become that? Oh, gosh. So who are we? So if you really, you know, I understand that most Americans, not all, but a significant number of Americans, I can't even say most, but a very significant number of Americans have gotten to the point that they vote now for the lesser of, uh, of multiple evils. Who is the lesser of evils this time around? Well, I got the answer for you. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just not doing it. Oh, I'm walking away. Man. I'm, man. I, I, I refuse to, to put my name behind any of those people. America considers itself great. In fact, America considers itself exceptional. And this is the best foursome we, we can put up on the first tee. I wouldn't play with any of these guys, even if they owned the golf course. <laughs> One does. One does. Yeah, maybe if it was Augusta National, I'd I hold my nose. And, uh, <laughs> Sometimes you say, oh, I'd still play with you if you invited me. But, yeah, yeah, if it was Augusta National, maybe I would. Well, or Cypress yeah. Point. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a hypocrite. Well, you guys can answer this. Are names important? We don't have to go in the clubhouse. <laughs> okay. Are names important? Uh, last time I checked, yes. Names are extremely important. Yeah. So if you decide to vote, that's you putting your name right, that's behind right. one of these people. That's right. I'm not going to do it. None of these people are anybody that represents anything I believe. No, <laughs> no. When um, when he first came out neutral on uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, yeah. crisis, which is like being neutral on a rape uh, between the perpetrator and the victim, uh, I, I just wanted to puke. Now, he has subsequently reversed course on that. Uh, and then when he said, you know, the first one was uh, Mexicans are, uh, uh, are sending us the rapists, you know, uh, I lived in uh, Southern California. Uh, I have a son in uh, in Texas. Um, uh, I've spent much of my life surrounded by uh, Mexican Americans. Some of my closest friends are Mexican Americans. Um, and you know, something. One of the things that I found is that that uh, 
in terms of character and work ethic and uh, and devotion to family and this sort of thing, uh, they're superior in character and attitude in that regard to most other people I've met. And I would I would not people I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's such a simple solution to uh, to immigration. You know, you're you're not going to send 20 to 40 million people back across the border. First of all, it'd be impossible. And, uh, and second, uh, you'd, you'd become a, a merciless laughingstock amongst nations for even attempting to do it. But if you were to say, all right, I'll tell you what we're going to do this time. We can't encourage more of this by, uh, by simply granting citizenship. Like it, it is. Yeah, and allow all of these people to instantly receive Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and, and uh, welfare and food stamps and all that kind of stuff. So we'll just have, and we, we can't change the nation in terms of its voting um, that dramatically. So we'll, why don't we do this? Why don't we have a 10-year, 15, 20-year plan where if you continue to work, you pay your uh, your taxes, you pay your fair share, you, uh, you're you part of the society that that. Over a 20-year period, you can earn your citizenship and earn all the benefits and rights uh, of citizenship. But between now and then, you don't get any of the freebies. How, how tough would that be? Um, it's just about the only practical solution. And, and you know what they would do? They would gladly do that. Of course. They would gladly do well, that. Yeah, a path to uh, to earn the benefits and, uh, and rights. Now, the fact is that 20 years from now, there's not going to be an America. But uh, you know that. We know that. The rest of the world and <laughs> they don't. They don't right know that. Time to get the, the house loan? No. <laughs> yeah. And how many times have you heard uh, these uh, buffoons talk about the fact that our national debt uh, and, uh, and interest-bearing debt is, uh, is quickly rising now to $20 trillion, and our unfunded mandates now are... Uh, are Scaring a hundred trillion, and who's talking about our debt? Nobody. Nobody. I found that terribly interesting. Uh, they little up and paying attention. They just don't. Nobody wants to go there. You know, I read an article the other day that that Obama's uh, new budget actually cuts the uh, the deficit, reduces the deficit, and so rather than taking the deficit down from what is no nineteen trillion down to what fifteen trillion, that would be reducing it, right? Mm -hmm. Having some budget surpluses that uh, reduce it? No, 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 no. He's reducing it because the uh, his original budget for the next ten years would That's increase really that would increase the debt from twenty trillion to thirty trillion. But he has a uh, a provision to raise taxes on the most productive that will only raise it six trillion to twenty six trillion. So the difference between Thirty trillion and twenty-six trillion, and uh, and that's a reduction. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think that's how you know the, <laughs> the central bank they keeps postponing raising the interest rate when they need to raise the interest rate, but they have to realize that everybody realizes that if they raise the interest rate, then the interest on the debt will absolutely escalate right. this thing. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. The interest on the debt is. Uh, but they don't address that. Right. Right. This is the real reason, guys. Right, but you know, understand that one of the reasons they don't have to raise the interest rate is because in the past we we solicited countries and large uh, wealthy individuals to loan us money, and for them to loan us money so that we didn't go bankrupt, we had to pay them. A, we had to pay them a fair interest rate. But China and Japan and Saudi Arabia and wealthy individuals and countries don't want to loan us any money, not at any interest rate. And so what we did is we came up with what's called quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is that the Fed loans America the money, but it doesn't provide the money. It's not money that has been earned and saved and is now being loaned in this typical sense. It's money that they, they create by diluting the value of existing money. And so, and since it is, since they're now charging interest on on something that never existed, even 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 a two tenths of one percent earnings on that which never existed is a pretty good deal. <laughs> you know, for example, if I told you, Kirk, that that I would pay you two tenths of one percent on a trillion dollars that you didn't provide. 
but I'd give you the interest anyway. You'd have to say, that's a pretty fair deal. You're my best friend. But, but if I said, Kirk, I want you to loan me $100,000, and I'm going to pay you 2%, two-tenths of 1% interest on that $100,000, and I may or may not pay you back, that deal. you might walk away from that deal. Yeah. Well, that's the quantitative easing. That's what we have done to create the illusion that America is still solvent. Now, interestingly, this week I watched a thing on uh, Frontline, and it was a, a covert uh, photographing and reporting of Saudi Arabia. They suggested, uh, now they, well, they said that uh, Saudi Arabia, because of the cost of oil going so down so far, right. they're not able to right. provide any money for the things that they've been holding off people from uh, rioting. Mm -hmm. And they don't have it, and they estimate in five years all of their reserves we got every drop, right. other than what they've started away from themselves and overseas mm -hmm. banks. But everything in their so-called budget it will be gone yeah. in five years. Yeah, that's why uh, in so what Saudi Arabia, what, yeah, what Saudi Arabia has done is that the royal family to to continue to have the population support them having what is essentially a personal estate. Now, Saudi Arabia is the personal estate of the Saud family. Uh, it was given to them by the British because the Saud family, and uh, in concert with uh, uh, Wahib, uh, uh, Wahab, uh, the fundamentalist Muslim cleric, fought the Ottoman Turks with, uh, with uh, British uh, weapons. And so they rewarded them with their own personal estate, like them called Saudi Arabia. And... To keep the population from um, from revolting, because they are a revolting family, they uh, they pay them just got awful amounts of money not to work. So the citizens of Saudi Arabia are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year not to work. No one works in Saudi Arabia. That's why they have to bring in uh, so, many uh, slaves. So, so many slaves, and the, the people they bring in are are mistreated slaves, and so. Uh, because of the of the the fact that the price of oil has fallen by uh, by two thirds, they are now giving out far more money than they're taking in, and so the bribe system is beginning to to fall apart. And when that happens, the power in Saudi Arabia will no longer be the bribe, but the religion. And so there will be a revolt in Saudi Arabia, and the fundamentalist. Sunni Muslim jihadists will take over the country. Now, what the the older Sauds don't care because these these are all the many sons of the original Saab that uh, that leagued with Wahhab the, to take on the Turks. They're all old. They're all old. They're dying, and so the only Saud now that matters is the son of the present king. And in his case, he's spending the country's money on weapons. What he's doing is he's trying to build such a substantial military that the people of Saudi Arabia will not be able to revolt against their government, the same condition that exists in America. You can't fight City Hall because City Hall is armed to the teeth. Yeah. Well, they are they are revolting now. That was what the show was doing. There was about five people that were taking pictures of everything and reporting, and four of them had to quit because they were being hauled off. And the last one, he said, "This is it. This is my last report because uh, they 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 don't get me." So, oh yeah, oh yeah, they're absolutely and, and, not afraid to get out. Right, and and somebody that criticizes the Sauds or Islam in Saudi Arabia will be get will given up be given a hundred lashes. And we either die from those lashes, or we'll uh, we'll be spend eternity in the most hellish prison you could possibly imagine. So so is the uh, the state of the world. Yeah. Methinks that uh, that these are the dark ages that um, that Yahweh talked about. You know that first statement of the ninety first Psalm. God began by specifically saying that He was going to protect us through these dark hours. And, in fact, I, I just want to clarify something, because I did receive a note from a very good friend um, uh, yesterday okay. on this. Uh, when I considered why it was uh, through the darkness of night, that the protection was going to endure through the darkness of night, uh, there were a, a considerable number of ideas that 
Police were open to consideration. I was suggesting when we began the opening statement uh, uh, is interesting in terms of it. Uh, it talks about protecting us through the darkness of uh, of night. I want to read it uh, to you in an amplified uh, way and then uh, discuss it a little bit because uh, I may have given uh, the impression of more than is actually in the text. It says, he who dwells, inhabits, and lives restored. He who camps out after being renewed. In the marriage covenant, in the sheltered covering, covering within the protected place, which is carefully concealed from sight. A safe harbor and sanctuary of the Eliom, the Almighty. So as to be withdrawn, ascending to meet the light while gaining status and splendor in the shadow and resulting image, in the likeness and resemblance, as a result of hovering over and being submerged in the protection, the successful empowerment, and the prosperity of the most extensive and powerful mighty one, the most expansive, capable, and influential one. With the ability to cultivate and nourish and bless life, he will continually abide, dwelling for an extended period of time. Remaining during the night, he will lodge and live on an ongoing basis, therefore endure through the time of darkness. Now, the impression that I may have given uh, wasn't designed to do anything more than to, to be completely open to what God is saying and to being reluctant to set limits. So in other words, not being dogmatic. Mm-hmm. And, and so what I said is, you know, there's a possibility if you were just to read this by itself that, that he's going to protect us through the time of darkness. Well, the ultimate time of darkness is the tribulation. Maybe that's what he's saying here, that we're going to stay through the tribulation as lights in a dark world. Now, for part. But, so, and then you can say, okay, well, the tribulation has uh, as parts. There's the you know initial part prior to the Magog War. Then there's the midterm, uh, and then the second half. The second half is the worst uh, part of it. And during the second half, we would be of absolutely no value because by the second half, you either take the mark of the beast or you reject it. And if you take the mark of the beast, there's no resolution. No hope whatsoever. Yeah, no hope whatsoever. Then it'll kill you the other way. So. Right. So. Um, uh, I was at least open to the idea that through the time of, uh, of darkness, that that could be speaking in the tribulation. But, you know, realistically, what God is talking about is protecting us right now. This is the time of darkness. Mm-hmm. Now, when, when through the prophet Yahshua, Isaiah, Yahweh said, you know, for periods of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, he looked for someone that he could uh, work through, someone that, that he could communicate through. He couldn't find anyone. I would call that a time of darkness. I would say that the world has been living in a time of darkness really since uh, the time uh, uh, of the garden. Yeah, (laughs) to some degree, from the time we walked out of the uh, the garden to the time that the light returns in year 6,000, yeah, you could say that. And and most certainly would be able to say that from the last of the prophets uh, in about 500 BCE uh, through... um, uh, this time, I mean, I think it's all a time of uh, of darkness, and so I think that is primarily what he's saying, as it relates to the harvest that we know of, of uh, that is called teruah and its ultimate fulfillment. I suspect that the best <coughs> indicator of that is actually um, Yeshaya 17, where God is talking about <coughs> this approach to the last days and and how things fall into place, and, and he begins by saying that that Syria, greater Syria is going to fall mm-hmm. to the terrorists, and then he says Damascus itself will become a heap of ruins, a twisted heap of ruins. So we've got, we should have expected this war that we're witnessing in Syria. We should have expected the success of the jihadists there, if you want to call success uh, what they have have done, we should expect that uh, that that Assad would remain in power uh, for a while because uh, you know we're we're still you know 2026 is the is the fall of 2026 is really the start of the seven year tribulation so 
we should have expect should have expected Russia to come in and uh, and prop up the Assad regime because he'd already been gone had they not done so. Oh, absolutely. But, but ultimately, we should expect that, and for certain, that Damascus is going to fall. Then after that, we're told that that Israel, Israel, will be thinned at the waist, which means that the world is going to compel Israel to give up the West Bank. It's already given up Gaza, which will make it about 15 to 20 miles wide at its thinnest point where 70 percent of the population live. And we know in the words. I mean, that's yeah, that's in the words. That's what that's what the Abominator wants Here to do. It's what George Bush before him wanted to uh, to do. It's what the UN wants to do. It's whatever Islamic nation wants to do as a first step. And uh, and what will happen is the same thing as when the world played this game the last time. Uh, Neville Chamberlain sacrificed the high ground of Czechoslovakia to Adolf Hitler, and and within six months the world was engaged in World War II. The moment that Israel is thinned at the waist, Yahweh has already said that Muslims by the millions, perhaps by the hundreds of millions, are going to flood into Israel as jihadists. Now, between the time that Israel is thinned at the waist and the time that Muslims stream into Israel by the tens of millions, if not the hundreds of millions, we're told that there will be a harvest. That's the true harvest. So it's sometime between those two events. And, you know, we have, and I don't know if if, if uh, it is Christian eschatology that has has caused this to be our perception, but when, you know, Daniel doesn't just predict the rise and fall of nations, including the Roman Empire and the nation, the, the entity that, the beast, if you will, that rises out of Imperial Rome, which is the Roman Catholic Church, treading upon the whole world. He he not only provides the exact timing that Yosha would walk into Jerusalem to be cut down, but not for himself, predicting that it was going to occur four days before Passover in, in year 4000, yeah, 33 CE. He also speaks of the seven-year period that we we know of as the time of Jacob's troubles, the tribulation. And, and it talks about that the Torahless one is, uh, and he's not the Antichrist, he's the Torahless one. Mm -hmm. The Torahless one is going to um, come onto the scene um, at, uh, at uh, and the, the event that's going to kind of launch his, uh, his status, his fame, is going to be that he's going to somehow be associated with this peace treaty, this reaffirmation, it's probably of UN 242, mm -hmm. that's going to sacrifice the West Bank to the, the Muslims. But what we do not know is whether or not that affirmation takes place uh, in, the, uh, in 2025, 2024, 2023, 2026, 2027. We, we've had this, this in our mind that somehow the affirmation uh, is, uh, is tied to the first day of the tribulation. But there's no reason for us to, to come to that conclusion. In other words, we could still be harvested on Teruwa in the fall of 2026. After the affirmation of this treaty, it ends Israel at the waist. Before the Muslims flood into uh, Israel in the Magog War. And well, be gone, oh, yeah, and be gone on the true in between. Uh, so uh, gone before the tribulation begins, but after the peace treaty is formed and before the Muslims attack Israel. So I still lean towards 2026, but you know it could be 2027. Uh, but we're, I don't think we can say for certain that the peace treaty that ends Israel at the waist is day one of the tribulation. No. But it, it would have to happen before the Magog War. Yes, it happens before so the Magog War. The third, third of the world. Well, the second phase of that war. Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah they, well, the, you know, it, 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 yeah, it, yeah. Right. There are, uh, uh, I think there's three phases of the war. One is where Muslims uh, by the gazillions uh, flood into uh, Israel, and uh, Yahweh stops them. Um, and 
that there's going to be a huge death toll as a result of, uh, of that. Um, and then there's going to be a uh, enormous death toll that will be that the wars that will be promoted around the world in concert with that are it's going to lead to the death of lots of people. There is the uh, uh, most likely going to be in the second phase of it a nuclear exchange, and then ultimately uh, there is the the striking of an asteroid and the uh, uh, yeah Apophis and uh, and also yeah the. The uh, Carne Viejo, um, the the old volcano, uh, sliding into the uh, the sea, creating a um, tsunami effect um, yeah. across the Atlantic. All those things are going to happen, and collectively, um, first a quarter of the Earth's population and a third of what remains, so half overall of the Earth's population, is no more by the uh, the midpoint of the tribulation. Yeah. So anyway, those are my my thoughts on timing. I, I'm uh, uh, but that said, you know, the the revelation comment is that we'll be kept out of the uh, of the great tribulation. Now, that could mean we're kept out of the last three and a half years. That could be, means we're kept out of the entire period. And it also means that, you know, this is spoken in, in Hebrew, yeah. recorded by religious people in Greek. And then uh, you know, and you're you're twisted. You know, yeah, twisted, and and you know, we we know that there are more differences, more discrepancies between the the various Greek texts than there are words in the text. Uh, so you know, you're you're always have to be very careful when you're taking anything from the uh, the Greek. Let me, uh, along those lines, let me ask you a question that might be relevant uh, as we move forward in 91, but currently I was asked to, by a friend of ours, to translate a little something, one little passage, uh, okay. one song. And so I went to the Dead Sea Scroll Bible, and I found out that every word in there, save one, uh, is extant. And so everything comes from the Masoretic, so I'll go through all the Masoretic things, and mm -hmm. Those are so uh, heavily saturated with words where they translate them as uh, to worship and right. bow down and on and on and on. And you might have 20 meanings that are negative and one where it means respect and, and um, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. So I, I'm making note of all that stuff. And gosh, it's hard when, there's, when they really decide to – now, this is a, a thing, which I believe it is, of Dode. The mm -hmm. Psalm of Dode. It is. Ain't nowhere in the 119th Psalm that I've got Dode saying bow down. No. And, and things like that. So I mean, so I reject those, and and I I can't prove it in the sense of overwhelming evidence, but it's so logical that this is not right. These are clerics who are paid. Right. Um, you know, they've twisted for their religious purposes, and. Yeah. Uh, so I have yeah. to go with that. So I mean, and so when I do that, I, I have a little trepidation because I worry about. Oh gosh, I hope I'm not really taking too many liberties. But I don't know how else to get through these. Yeah, when they're the, so blatant. One of the, the challenges is with the 91st Psalm is the most heavily edited uh, passage that I have yet encountered. And there are whole s sections of it that are different to the Dead Sea Scrolls than they are in the Masoretic text. Now, part of the challenge here is that we, you have to recognize that, that the Masoretic text specifically edited things that were um, in disagreement with Rabbinic Judaism. The Masoretic text came to exist around 1100 CE. And, and so, by that time, the the codicils of of uh, rabbinic Judaism were pretty well established, and so, for example, in Yeshaya 53, where it says, you know, they have pierced my hands and feet, speaking of the the form of uh, of um, physical uh, death that would occur to the Passover lamb. Um, they changed it to they gnaw at my uh, my lion, uh, no. yeah my paws and you know uh, they yeah that like a lion's paws they they gnaw or something I mean, it's just ridiculous I mean it's just absurd to get around that and so what you uh, what you find is that that's the kind of stuff that they they typically edit um, in the ninety first psalm you you are particularly at the end you're confronted by an entirely different set of circumstances. And there you've got to realize that there are some texts 
that the Masoretes um, did not um, uh, mess, with. Think, mess with, and that the Essenes, who were the scribes for the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they had their issues, mm-hmm. and that the Essenes um, uh, claimed the 91st Psalm as defending the the righteous one, the righteous teacher, which was, this goes back to the Essenes' arguments with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, goes back to the Maccabeans and to the time where there was a transition between the uh, Louis, the Levites, being the priest to serve as as uh, uh, those who officiate and unite uh, at the Moed Mikre, uh, as designated by Yahweh, being born into it without rights to property and that sort of thing. And those who wanted the job for the power and money and influence it would provide them, but that were not Louis. And so there was this this fight between them for the control of what was emerging as a Jewish religion in the second and third century BCE, and the um, the Essenes uh, had this affinity for for their leader, who they thought was the rightful heir to be the chief priest, and he was vested by uh, by others who thought that it shouldn't be inherited as a birthright according to the Torah, but but taken based upon who is the most Qualified. Let's use that term, and and so uh, that's where they they hearken, and so they were they had less power, less influence. They were um, they were ostracized from the mainstream of the Sanhedrin by the Sadducees, who were the liberal uh, political types, and the Pharisees, who were the fundamentalist religious wackos, the Essenes were ostracized. And that's why they were down there in Qumran, in their little uh, hovel down there in Qumran. And so um, when you read something that they would have claimed for themselves, then you would expect them to edit it in such a way as it would resonate with them. And I think that what we... Because they were, their savior was the righteous teacher, and the righteous teacher is not Yahweh. It's not Yosha. Uh, the righteous teacher is a um, is a uh, religious hack that uh, that they thought had yeah that they thought had more rights to the position of power than than uh, the Maccabees uh, uh, rival individual, and so. They, anything they can do to esteem that individual and to distance the passage from Yahweh, they'll do. And so that's what I see as why the difference in the Essene version of Psalm 91 is quite different than the Mesoretic and the Septuagint. And, the, and in this case, the Mesoretic and the Septuagint agree in opposition to the, um, uh, the Essene version. I tell you, it takes some work, don't it? It does. Okay, it does. Well. Yeah, it does. You know, my my proclivity is that I recognize there's no such thing as a perfect human. Uh, Scott's pretty close, but uh, besides well, Scott, Scott, yeah, yeah, Scott. But so. but you know, it's uh, there aren't a lot of perfect humans out there, and as a result, um, if uh, I got to meet this guy, yeah, that's is right. You're talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, I uh, I spent a lot of time. Um, you probably know I've been most of my time now uh, translating and uh, commenting on Yahweh's uh, testimony. And uh, and what I find is that uh, I make a lot of typos. And most of my typos are are just you know I'm I'm think I'm writing or and I write of you know just because the fingers are flying across the keyboard. And you know and I have spell check and I've got the ability to you know highlight it when it's wrong. And, and I still make mistakes. Now, what about these guys that are uh, are writing on an animal skin with a bird feather using uh, uh, dyes they they got from uh, from squished clams? No, no erasers, no spell check, <laughs> no no uh, copy and paste. I mean, they're going to make a few mistakes. So 
we should not expect the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls to be perfect. They're just old, they're 1,200 years to 1,400 years older than the oldest Masoretic. And they are uh, uh, written in Yisrael as opposed to written in Babylon, where the Masoretic was first scribed. Uh, so there's, there are, it's, it's usually more accurate, but that does not mean it's perfect. Now, now the problem here, I mean, the, the, I want to be careful here. In the Greek, the problem, apart from one situation, is irreconcilable. And when it comes to, to the eyewitness accounts, which is really all I care about, um, so long as Yosha is citing or paraphrasing the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, you can get a pretty darn accurate um, understanding of what he said. But it takes some time because you've got to go look, okay, this is what he's quoting. How is it written in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms in Hebrew? And then you can undo the damage that Greek has, uh, has done to the statement. Now, with the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, the copyists were a lot less free. And so on average, between the Mesoretic and the Dead Sea Scrolls, one word in uh, 14 is different versus, of course, the difference between the 69 first, second, and third century manuscripts, the codexes of the Christian New Testament, and, uh, and the Nestle Allen and the Texas Receptus. In that case, there are 300,000 known variants and 182,000 words. You know, that's more than one for one versus yeah. one in 14. So there was a lot more diligence. Uh, so it's not nearly as flawed. And the other thing that's beneficial is that the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms are one cohesive whole. Same author, same purpose, same message. So everything that God has to say about who he is, what he's offering, what he expects in return, and what will get you um, in harmony with him and what will get you separated from him, uh, whether it's Shalom or Azab, mm -hmm. he says from hundreds of different perspectives uh, so many times that, that after a while you, you come to say, this is who he is, this is what he's offering, this is what he expects, and if there's a conflict in, uh, in one word in, in 14, you just simply resolve the word so that it's consistent with the other hundred times he said the same thing. Fair enough. So I, I just don't see it as a problem in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. It's too easy to resolve mm -hmm. because God's consistent. The message is consistent. He says the same thing over and over again uh, from different perspectives because that's how we learn. And that is how you eliminate the flaws of, of man. Yeah, so so as long as you as long as you know that this is umpteen times he said this, that's that's gotta be a mistranslation is the same, right? If if he's told us a hundred times that he wants us to respect and revere him as a father, and then you read that uh, someplace that uh, he wants us to fear him yeah. Then you would have to recognize that. Yeah, 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 we got we had a real problem. Way. If if the most important description that can be applied to a person by Yahweh is the description that Yahweh applied to Do to David to say that he was Sadak. Sadak means upright. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. It means right, and it means upright. And uh, and you read that someone has endured themselves to God because they have bowed down which is the antithesis of being upright, mm -hmm. then you would know that uh, that's not right. Something is wrong there. Now, I have never, I've never encountered one, but should you encounter one, you would know that's, no, that's not right. That's, somebody has mistranslated that. There's a, now, I, I will tell you, here's a great example. I'm, I'm translating what I think is by far the most difficult book to translate, by far and away. It's Yashi Isaiah. And it's by far the hardest because the vocabulary is the uh, is unique to it. Um, the vocabulary, you know, the Torah, it's God says the same thing over and over again using the same words. 
you know, you, you come to know 250 to 500 words, and, and you've got the Torah licked, man. It's, uh, it's not hard to understand. It's very easy to translate, fast to translate, easy to understand. Well, there are so many interesting shades of these words and so many different words to convey nuances of the same concept in, uh, in Hebrew. By the time you get to Yashiyah, which is the most interesting of the prophets, because first of all, Yashiyah commenced his revelation exactly 700 years from the time that the Torah was revealed. Isn't that interesting? And uh, he wrote, "A child is born, uh, a son. Uh, a child is uh, is born, a son is given to us." Uh, exactly 777 years before that promise was fulfilled. And so you're you're um, you're dealing with um, with something that is just really extraordinary in its uh, in its timing, and the and the intellect that went into conveying it was way beyond anything that I have yet experienced. You know, Dode, for example, uh, Dode is brilliant, but the tools Dode wields to communicate are consistent. You know, like a good songwriter, I'm going to take the words people understand them and use those words and, and all the right ways to, to reemphasize a, a theme. That's not true in, in Yashiga. And so, you know, one place it, it took uh, the word rib, which is to quarrel, to contend with. And then it, uh, the next is uh, uh, Amon, an Amana, which is translated widow. And so the last instruction is to rib, quarrel, and contend with the widow. Now, come on. That doesn't want us to contend and quarrel with widows. No. And so everybody changes the definition in their English translation of rib to plead. As in, you're pleading a case for the widow. But you can't do that because rib only means plead in the sense of, uh, of, of pleading an argument in opposition to the widow. And so then you, you'd have to say, all right, since rib is a very common term and it's used all over the place, uh, R-Y-B, and it clearly means to, in fact, it means to mock, to insult, to taunt, to ridicule. To use your words to be extremely hostile to. That's what rib means. Mm -hmm. So what would God want us to be hostile to? Well, you, you realize that uh, if I say amana, well, what part of that word uh, would you immediately say, well, all that does is make the first letters what it's conveying feminine? Mm -hmm. The ah at the end, right? Yeah. So all I've got really is if I take the ah at the end and realize, all right, we're giving this a feminine spin uh, from a feminine perspective, and he's about ready to introduce the whore of Babylon. Uh, yeah, no, now all I got to do, right? Now all I have to do is uh, is translate uh, Amon. And son of a gun, Amon is those who have chosen to be bound. Well, religion I know. I know. from uh, Ligon in uh, in the Latin means to be bound. Mm -hmm. Those who have been silenced, those who are dumb, those who are in league with a uh, with a, in a excuse me, in, a, in league with a, within a congregation engaged in worship. So contend with, mock, ridicule, religion. Yeah. Mock religion. Yeah. That's what the whore of Babylon is all about, and so. Yeah, it's, uh, I know you, to, to be able to correctly and consistently convey what God is saying, you do have to invest a fair amount of time. And, and, uh, I mean, there is, in the case of Amon, for example, there is nothing, uh, that, uh, with Amon that is positive. It's all negative. And so Amana would be the feminization of the, this negative. Just as the whore of Babylon is the symbol of Satan influencing the uh, religion, which is uh, viewed as a feminine concept. Well, you, Queen of Heaven, on and on and on. Yeah, Mother of God. Mother of God. Yes. You know, the church is, is always a she. She. Yeah. Mother Church. The Mother Church. So if we pick up where we had left off, uh, this would be Ms. Moore lyrics, Psalm 91.8. It reads, 
you will merely observe and study. The merely there is not a pejorative term. It's not a demeaning term. It's a, you know, you're so stupid. All you can do is, uh, is study. I mean, you're never going to get your nose out of the library. No, it's, it's merely in the sense of uh, that my exposure to Islam, you know, I'm conveying the 91st Psalm from my personal perspective. I'm absolutely convinced that the 91st Psalm was written to all of the covenant's children, that anyone in the covenant that chooses to engage in uh, what God wants done, which is to share the truth, something that's very unpopular, and to expose and condemn lies, something else that's very unpopular, because you have to be in opposition to your government, to patriotism, to the military, to political parties, and to all religions. That if you're willing to do what God wants to do, if you're, if you're willing to take the same stand that he takes in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, then you need protection. Because you'd be one voice crying out in, the, in a wilderness surrounded by M1 Abrams tanks and A-10 uh, uh, attack uh, uh, aircraft and Apache uh, gunships and, and all manner of weapons with everybody pointed them at you. I mean, the only chance you would have is, is that they're so zealous in, uh, in shooting you and they're surrounding you that they all blow each other up. But, but uh, you need protection. So I think it's to anyone who is willing to do that role. And you might say, oh, boy, why would you want to do that? Why would you want the whole world to turn against you? Best job you could possibly have. It's a great job. And Yahweh does a marvelous job of of protecting those that uh, engage in it. So when this says you will merely observe and study, uh, that means that, that God likes to work your part. People. Yeah, that your part is to, to be observant and to study uh, the, the foe, whether it be like you did with government showing that, uh, mm -hmm. that Woodrow Wilson deliberately perpetrated what's called the Spanish flu and is responsible for the deaths of 100 million people. And uh, and that it's our job to expose and condemn government and religion. And but in doing it, what God wants us to do is He doesn't want us to pick up a weapon and go off and and engage and shoot them. He doesn't want us even to to have to um, to go away someplace to confront them in person. What he wants us to do is to study, to take the time to be prepared, to learn the truth. Be, you can't be an advocate for the truth or an advocate against that which is a lie unless you're willing to invest the time to observe and to think about what, uh, what you have seen. So merely here means that's our job. We aren't going to uh, pick up a gun and go blasting people. We're going to blast them with our words. So you're merely going to observe and study. You will only look at and evaluate. You will exclusively gaze upon and consider. You will look at and think about the proper response. This was written in the Hippel Imperfect Active. This means that God would help, uh, in the case of taking it personally, me see and then facilitate my evaluation of what I witnessed on an ongoing basis with unfolding results so long as I actively engaged in the process. So you will merely observe and study with your eyes the consequence and the suffering of the guilty and wicked. So in, whether it be the first phase, which was to expose and condemn Islam, or the second phase, which was to expose and condemn Judaism by revealing what the Torah actually says, or the third phase, which was to expose and condemn Pauline Christianity, that our role, my role in that, was simply going to be to look at what God said, look at what these adversarial institutions wrote with my eyes, that I wouldn't have to endure their suffering. I, I would not have to go to Syria to be able to expose the cause of Islamic terrorism. I would not have to go to the Vatican to expose and condemn the flaws of Behavior. Christianity. And that, that the consequence of their suffering was something that I would witness, but only with my eyes. That is a, uh, that's a marvelous thing. It says you're going to yeah, engage in a battle. Know. Yeah, but you're going to engage with your eyes and with your mind and with your mouth. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, uh, you're not going to be afflicted by them. You're not going to be harmed by them. The consequence of their suffering is not something you're going to endure. That's, that's the way you'd want a, fa a father to be. 
You know, for example, I want my children to be informed so that they know, for example, that the Roman Catholic Church has been a, if not the worst, one of the worst institutions in all of human history. And I want them to know that they ought not trust their government, that a military is a counterproductive institution, not a positive one. I want them to examine history and to examine uh, news and think about it so that they can form those conclusions. I don't want them to join the military to understand that the military is corrupt. You know, I don't want them to join the Roman Catholic Church to understand that the Roman Catholic Church is corrupt. I don't want them to go to Syria to appreciate that Islam is corrupt. Do it with your eyes, with your mind. And God will protect you from its consequence. So that's a, uh, that's a positive way to uh, to communicate what we're going to be doing. It's exactly what, what we do here. What, yeah, what happened with me. I mean, uh, what I did to create Prophet of Doom is I took the two chronological, uh, the two, if you will call, historical collections of hadith. Uh, everything in Islam is hadith. The Quran itself is hadith. Hadith means oral report. It's an oral report from from Muhammad uh, passed by hearsay, uh, ear to mouth to ear, over the course of anywhere from from 100 years to 200 years, uh, strictly by verbal repetition of the old game of telephone as a kid. Uh, and so 100% of what we have in Islam, the Quran and Hadith are all, the Quran, yeah, the Quran and Hadith are all Hadith. That's how they were retained. That's how they were communicated. That's how they were retained. The written Arabic didn't even exist at the time that the Quran was allegedly revealed. So I took the two chronological uh, collections of hadith. One is by Ibn Ishaq. That's called the Sira, the biography. The other one is, is called the Tariq, which is the history of Islam. One was by, compiled by Ishaq. The other one compiled by Tabari. They have enormous, enormous commonality between the two of them. So I used those two chronological accounts to, to know everything that was knowable about Muhammad's life. What he did when he did it. What he said when he said it. And then knowing that, it became fairly easy to reorder the Quran chronologically. And the Quran is a, an absolute jumbled mess. It has no context. It has no chronology. It's as if a tornado picked up isolated statements and just threw them together haphazardly. Uh, and without context, without chronology, it's impossible to understand any message. I mean, uh, the, the number one rule that I have for translating Yahweh's testimony is I will never, ever translate anything out of context. Somebody says, can you give me a translation on Isaiah 17.2? No. No, I, I'm happy to, if, if time permits, to to translate all of, uh, of Yasha Yah 17, but I'm not going to give you um, a uh, statement out of context. You have to understand the context. I began my, for example, my overall presentation of Yasha Yah by saying, here's the context. Here's the context of the prophets. Here's the context of the Lord Kingdom. Here's the context of of Yahuda, here's the uh, the context of the uh, of the kings of these places. Here's the context of the nations that were vying for power around them. If you don't understand the context, you can't understand the message. And so, I took these two hadith sources, the Tariq and the Sirah, and one of which was the oldest book in Islam's history, it was compiled about 125 years after Muhammad's death, and the other within 200 years. And I use them to reorder the Quran in chronological order and set the Quran's word into the context of Muhammad's life. And when you do that, using your eyes, using your brain, all of a sudden Islam is laid out naked and bare, transparent in Hillary Clinton's words. It's obvious that Muhammad was a sexual pervert and a mass-murdering, ruthless, conniving terrorist that he created Islam as a criminal enterprise to enrich himself and that his God was modeled after Satan. That, it just becomes obvious. There's no denying it. It's irrefutable. Everything makes sense when you do those things. Now, that's how the book was written. It was written exactly as God said that we would do it together. And 
you know, read Prophet of Doom. It is, it is exactly as I have described it. Yeah. Because you, Yahweh, have invoked certainty. Appointing and placing by invitation, making available the sheltered sanctuary. Of the Almighty, your place to dwell together. Psalm 91, 9. That's the thing I like about, I mean, there's a lot of things I like about God. Yeah, a whole lot of things. I know that just, he's just an extraordinary, appealing individual. But one of the things I really like about him is absolute certainty. It, it, when, gosh, I hated faith. Oh, man, you're constantly told how terrible doubt is. You've got all these people who are just complete hypocrites and are trying to pretend that their faith is greater than everybody else's faith. And there was never any basis for faith. But you were told that you just had to believe and that doubt was, was the enemy creeping into your mind. And, and oh, my God, it was, and you were just trying to always impress somebody else that you, you really believed that you didn't have any doubts. I was so uncomfortable. And finally, to meet God, he says, listen, i got no use for belief. i got no use for faith. I want you to know for certain. And I'm going to give you so much information in such a way that you will know for certain who I am, that I authored the text that you're reading, and that you can trust me. You can know for certain. Because you, Yahweh, have invoked certainty. Now, why, why does that not appeal to the Christian Community. Because, because when you present it, they just freak out because you actually challenge their faith and they yeah. get to death, I guess. Because they are told that doubt is 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 the epitome of of, of uh, faithlessness, which will send a person directly to hell. So when somebody challenges their faith, it becomes so frightening to them that they repel those words, and they have all been conditioned. This is the thing that was most helpful in understanding Islam. Satan plays a significant role in Islam. And so you'd say, well, how can Allah be modeled after Satan if, in fact, Islam warns against Satan and constantly says that anyone who challenges Muhammad's uh, message is leaguing with Satan? How can that be? How can Paul have spoken for Satan, have been demon-possessed, and yet speak out against Satan? Well, the answer is really simple, really obvious. And that is that, that Satan, Hasatan, the adversary, the Lord, does not want to be worshipped or known as the adversary. He wants to be known and worshipped as God. And he has a strong man, too. Right. So, so he wants the whole notion of Satan to be considered bad. Because he wants to be positioned as God. And, right. And so what the Christian has done is created this, this myth that if you criticize Paul, that you're being satanic. And so they dismiss the person who criticizes Paul, even if they're criticizing Paul with God's own words, as being satanic. So religion is wholly and completely irrational. Religion is a faith, and faith is the inverse of reason. You know, the, all the debates and, and philosophy through the years, it was always between faith and reason. So if you're advocating reason, and God, you know, I would just translate the last passage I uh, translated in Yasha Yah was, that says, Come, let's walk together and have a discussion where we reason together. Wow. God wants us to reason together. Uh, he, his communication to us is rational. He wants us to be rational. And he, he wants to spend eternity walking with us and talking with us, but not about, you know, you know, his idea of talking with us, though, is not for us to, uh, to enumerate our want list. You know, I, I want to get a, a base hit. I want to uh, score a touchdown. I want to date with the pretty girl. I want to win the, uh, the lottery. I want to do well on the next test. I want to, uh, to get a better job. You know, no, that's not his idea of, uh, of quality time. His idea of quality time is having a rational discussion while walking through his universe together. I mean, he's and, not afraid of questions. No, not, not at all. And, but the religious are. The Quran says he who questions will lose their faith. It says those who question the, uh, the Quran 
lost their faith, and as, a, as such, they became apostates. Well, in case of that, that's absolutely true, and Paul as well. Yes. If you ask questions and find, get the answers, you, you walk away. That is correct. So that is why the faithful religious individuals are in opposition to evidence and reason. Evidence and reason, if there were evidence to prove their religion, they wouldn't need faith. So it's an absence of evidence that they choose faith. And then faith doesn't exist where proof exists to denounce that, those beliefs. And so they will not consider proofs that repudiate their beliefs. So it's an isolating and indoctrinating circle. Faith leads to belief which rejects evidence and reason. If there is no evidence and reason, one has to believe. If one believes, they're in opposition to evidence and reason, which denounces their faith. It's a deadly circle, isn't it? It's a deadly circle, and there's no way out of it. That's why God says several times, I, uh, I cannot comprehend the religious. I can't endure the religious. I can't save the religious. Isn't that profound? And he, he says it over and over again, so... I'm, uh, I'm convinced that he means it. Oh, yeah. So, because you, Yahweh, have invoked certainty, appointing and placing by invitation and making available the Seltzerge Sanctuary. Appointing by invitation. What do you think he means by that? The Seltzerge Sanctuary. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Moed Mekre are invitations to meet with God. God has invited us to be called out of this world and to meet with him. That is what Tara, the verb that serves as the heart of Mekre, means is to invite. So he has appointed, the Moed, I have appointed meetings that are, that you are invited, Mikra, to attend that lead to, make available, the sheltered sanctuary. They lead us from the doorway of life, Pesach, across the welcome mat that perfects us, Matzah, to become adopted into Yah's family, Bukurim, to be enriched and empowered as children of God on Shabuah, so that we can do what we're doing now, be his troubadours on Teruah, helping to reconcile Yahweh and his chosen people, so that we can all sukkah camp out together. And that's uh, Kapodam leading to sukkah, camp out together in his sheltered sanctuary. That's the, where the invitations lead. So it is the sheltered sanctuary of the Almighty. His place, your place, to dwell together. So, you know, when you're, you're going to go off and, and um, use your words to quarrel with government and military thinking, militaristic thinking, and religion, you, you know, A, that you have complete confidence that you can trust everything that God has promised. But, m but the most important thing you know you can trust is that he has invited all of his children to live with him in his home forever. And there's nothing that, that provides greater confidence than that. You are risking nothing to um, when you're exposing and condemning the things that God's uh, opposed to, so long as you're doing so as a member of his covenant family. Because the worst they can do is take your life, which is already guaranteed to be immortal. Biggie. Yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a uh, wonderful confirmation. Then in 9111, this is because his spiritual envoys and agents, his malak, he will instruct and direct shawa concerning you and to approach you, to actually keep watch over you and genuinely guard you in all of your ways. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here. Um, first, the Malak, command and control regimen, their, their implements, their Yahweh's tools. Their spiritual tools, which means they're immortal. Their spiritual tools, which means they are, they look like light. They are, uh, but they're tools. The Malak have no free will. They do what they're told. And, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, you're, you know, if I, if I'm going to be a hammer, 
I'd like to be the ha uh, hammer in the hands of God. I, you know, it's a good gig. You're, you're immortal, and you get to work with the finest individual in all of creation. You're creator, man. He created you too. Yeah. And so these, uh, these spiritual envoys, Yahweh talks about how he uses them. And one of the ways he says he's going to use them is he's specifically going to have them protect those guard, watch over those who are engaged doing what God wants done, particularly when they're doing something that causes them to be threatened or harassed by others. Now, that's powerful in by itself. But beyond that, he says that he will instruct and direct them. Yeah. You know what I dug up on that one is uh, direct or call to turn or uh, mm -hmm. instructions for the path to take. You know, just keep you on the path. I mean, that's right. the oldest thing I could find. Yeah, and it so means to order right. and to decree, to appoint and to command, even a sign. With the peel stem, the object receives the effect of the decree, while in the imperfect, the assignment is an ongoing affair, and in the active voice, the subject acts while the object benefits. Well, we are the object. The subject is uh, is acting. Uh, it's Yahweh's uh, um, malak, and so he's telling his malak what to do. Yeah. Now he is providing it. He he didn't use you know I'm not commanding them. He is telling them what to do. He doesn't have to command. Doesn't have to issue an order. He's just telling them this is what I want you to do. So do it. It's like I if I hold a hammer in my hand and I swing my hand out, the, the hammer doesn't say no 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 no. That that was not a properly conveyed instruction. Oh, I just said, okay, that's, I know what you want to do. I'm going to do it. And, you know, even in Yasha Yah, it begins by saying, listen, heaven, because Yahweh has spoken. Well, even in heaven, in the spiritual realm, the Malak need to know what God has to say so they can carry out his instructions. You know, when, uh, when uh, um, what was the fellow's name now? If it's, um, I've had a senior moment, but the fellow that, that found the uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, and you gave me the disease. Oh, okay, well, okay. Well, it doesn't matter the individual's name. But anyway, when he found the Ark of the Covenant, went into the the room in uh, what is Yermiah's grotto, directly beneath the the place where Passover was an act, fulfilled by Yosha, and he found the receptacle of uh, where Ron White was his name, uh, where uh, the upright pole was placed in the crack in the earth that caused the earthquake and where the blood of uh, the Passover lamb dripped on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant directly below it. And uh, the Malak had the room all cleaned up and organized for him. And uh, looking at the Ark of the Covenant and the uh, ten tablets of stone, the, um, uh, the Malak... Uh, you know, when, when Ron said, can I take these out and photograph them? Can I photograph them here? You know, what can I do? And, you know, the mock said, no, 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 no. I'm here to watch these things. You can look at them. You're more than welcome to look at them. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here because my next official act uh, is that I'm going to hold these up when the Sunday law is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is invoked, which means when Christianity is invoked, the Sunday law. So, uh, so the Torahless one is going to invoke Christianity and uh, mandate it, and that's when this Malak says, "I have been instructed to hold up these tablets. That's what I'm going to do." Mm -hmm. And so he knew the game plan. Yeah. He knew the timing. He knew the reason. He knew the game plan. Uh, he he understood uh, what needed to be done. Yahweh is instructing and directing his Malak. Yeah, that would imply that they. They are watching him all the time and listening all the time, and they know pretty much all the game plan, don't they? Oh, they know the game plan, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there was no reason to doubt that they were doing Well, some people say they don't know this. I, I can't imagine why they've been there forever. Oh, yeah, it's because of the, the, the passage uh, in, uh, that, uh, that says not even the angels in the heaven know yeah, the, the day and the time. That's how, that's how, yeah, of course they know. Yeah, they're, they're eternal beings. They have direct access to, uh, to Yahweh. Of course they know. Uh, you know, it's a... Uh, that's yeah, complete and, and utter um, creation of something that was not actually said. So yeah. um, this is because his spiritual envoys and agents, his malak, he will instruct and direct concerning you to actually keep watch over you and genuinely guard you. This is interesting. This is Shamar. 
Shamar. To what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shamar, yeah, from our perspective, when Yahweh asks us to Shamar Torah, for example, that means he wants us to closely examine and carefully consider. Right. Well, so he's telling his Malak, I want you to closely examine and carefully consider. And Shamar also means to guard, to care for, to protect. You know, like a watchman, uh, uh, he keeps his eyes open and focused. Yeah, the guard for the sheep, yeah, to protect the sheep. So Shamar uh, conveys also this idea of, of guarding and protecting and caring about, watching over in a protective way. Keep safe, right? Right. So God is not a micromanager. He, he, he very, very seldom infringes on free will, even when people make horrendous decisions. And for example, for God to say, uh, you know, I'm going to protect a two-year-old child from getting run over the, by the car by changing the life of the driver of that car, uh, by changing the life of the guy that served the driver of that car drinks, by changing the life of the uh, of the guy that that founded the company that made the alcohol that uh, that was poured into the glass by the bartender and yeah, the person. And then I'm going to change the, uh, the the life of the person that manufactured the car that could be there. You know, God doesn't micromanage like that. No, then, yeah. then, then, then it's over. Yeah, it's over. I mean, it's just the whole thing is a charade. He does not do it. Now, then he can't but, do it. But he does engage in, in human affairs, and he has made a promise to protect his children when these children are engaged in his business. And so he can without making a ruse of, uh, of free will. If somebody were to say, you know, I just don't like artists. And that, that Captain Kirk, he, I do not like his art. I, I am going to snuff him out. Uh, when, well, Yahweh's not going to, uh, to intervene and preclude uh, them being an art critic. Nor is he going to intervene and cause them to be a better art critic. But he is going to preclude them from being successful in picking up a uh, a implement of uh, of mass uh, infliction to to, uh, to hurt you. So there you go. That's good not, to me. That's but, but you know, now Yahweh is not going to uh, to keep the rain from falling on your head. No. He is not going to keep the mosquito from biting you. He's not going to keep you and your wife from occasionally uh, scuffling over some uh, over some issue. He's not going to do that. He's not going to intervene in every aspect here. But he is going to help you when you seek to learn, and he is going to protect you when somebody uh, has decided they want to harm you because of the stand that you have taken on behalf of Yahweh. Then he intervenes. Right. Then he intervenes. You know, if I were to go out today and decide to drive my car 100 miles an hour uh, off a cliff, he's not going to intervene. No. Now, if I go out today and, uh, and go to get my mail and there's a, a Muslim that knows that I'm here and would like to drive his car 100 miles an hour to do me in, He'll he's, miss. he's going to stop that. Yeah. So that's that's what that is what's being uh, said here. Now, what's interesting, he says, to guard you in all of your travels, in all of your ways. So, in this particular case, this is what's kind of interesting. I, uh, after I accepted this mission from Yahweh, I was in my uh, plane. It was a Pilatus at the time, which uh, Pilatus is a wonderful airplane, but it has some uh, peculiar characteristics. One of the peculiar characteristics is that you, if you stall it, you're dead. And so it has a pusher shover uh, on it that, that engages automatically if you approach uh, stall to push the uh, the nose over to keep the airplane from stalling because if you stall it, you can't recover. You know, and in training aircraft, you can stall them. We we practice stalls. We practice recovering from stalls. And a Pilatus, you can't do it. And a Pilatus, it is prohibited for you to do a roll or a loop in a Pilatus because you, you can't survive it. And so I was over the Pentagon. Wake Vortex put me upside down. Finish the story. And in doing so, what I found was that that, that airplane was righted. Now, was I at that moment about, about Yahweh's business? No. But I had devoted my life to being about his business. And so while I was yeah, more work to do. in all of my ways and travels, he kept me alive. And that's what Derek means. Yeah, 
doing is exactly what Derek means. And the reason was is because I had devoted myself to this mission. Wow. So I want to thank you for uh, for listening today. We'll be back uh, this evening. Bob Show. Thank you, uh, Scott, for uh, for being with us. And uh, Kirk, I will speak with you in a few hours. Look forward to it. Bye.